are getting real on childhood cancer. It's a very shocking experience for a parent. Yeah. And we always advise parents, please let your child know. It's an emotional thing, very tough because the parents love their children. Mm. But we have to also tell them the reality. As the government, we really need to improve our diagnostics. Mm. We don't have even a tenth of what we require to diagnose cancer appropriately. I'm Tamima and welcome to the Real Talk Roundtable, this new edition of the show that promises to be a very transformational space. Well, today I have a very important topic lined up for you. We are getting real on childhood cancer. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen through the news and experienced it for those who knew those individuals, we've lost very important, prominent figures to cancer. Well, tonight, I want to start a discussion around childhood cancer because the reality is that somewhere in this country today a parent had the words your child has cancer words that can be devastating not only to the child but to the entire family so my guests will be sharing with us how they are living through the reality of having a child who has cancer in their family and what you and I need to know because the reality is today in the world childhood cancer remains the leading killer of children under the ages of 15 years welcome to real talk So my first guest on the show is Elizabeth Nyambura. Elizabeth is the mother to Dean. Dean is 13 years old and he is living with cancer. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth and Dean. So Dean, you have a very interesting name. Huh? Let's talk about all your full names. My name is Jacques Dean Gatehi. Jacques Dean Gatehi. Gatehi. So mom, tell us, you're Gina. Eh? You know, us chicks, we watch telenovelas. Then we get the names of Alejandro, Jacquez. So Jacquez, you call it up. In Litokwa, football. Oh, it had to be football. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we are here today on the round table to talk, a very, uh, to talk about a very important topic, childhood cancer. And you are a parent to a child who is living with cancer. So probably tell us about Jean's condition. Okay. Yeah, yeah, ndio akwena hiyo osteosarcoma bone cancer. Ni kuanguka alianguka. After kuanguka nikampeleka hospitali. Nikampeleka hospitali ya, ya kwanza karibu nyumbani. Wakaniambia akakuwa referred to another hospital. Na pengine mm. just clarify for us. Mm. Ukisema ni kuanguka alianguka mm. because mm. wazazi wanafahamu kuwa watoto wakicheza mm. wanaanguka. So hii kuanguka yake was it you know a, a big fall? Hapana alianguka tu alikuwa anafanya ile sauma sauti ya watoto so aka dislocate mkono kidogo venye ali dislocate akaanza kuwa na pain kidogo so nikampeleka hospitali ya nyumbani akakuwa referred Kiambu Kiambu ndio tena wakamwangalia for 2 month akakuwa referred Kijabe na alikuwa na umri gani alikuwa 12 years old 12 years old eh. so ukampeleka Kijabe eh, Kijabe ndio wakamfanyia biopsy wakasema akona osteosarcoma alifanyiwa biopsy date 24 april result zikatoka date 23 may na yeah. pale ukimpeleka hospitali yeah. na ukaambiwa mtoto wako ana kansa mm. osteosarcoma mm. kama mzazi ulisikiaje nilisikia vibaya kwa sababu hawakunipatia muda wa ati counseling ati cancer is not a death sentence au waliniambia mtoto wako ako na kansa na anafaa kukatwa mkono. That was it. Even ndivyo niliambia. Diagnosed and then then they tell you your child's arm has to be cut off. Yeah. And how did you break that news to your child? Tulikuwa na yeye nikiambiwa kwa sababu nilikuwa nimeenda kuchukua results za biopsy. So tulikuwa na yeye tulikuwa sisi wawili. Tukaambiwa unajua kansa? Mtoto wako ako na kansa na tunataka kumkata mkono saa hizi. Didn't you remember that day? Yes. And when the doctor told your mom that you have cancer and they wanted to cut off your arm, what were you feeling? Nilikuwa sikia vibaya kwa sababu singeweza kucheza na wengine bila mkono mmoja. Did you cry? Yes. Were you scared? 
So pale kama mzazi ushaambiwa mtoto wako sasa diag uh, the diagnosis ni cancer na daktari wanataka kumkata mkono. So what did you decide? Mi nilikata nikatoka tukaenda kuseka another opinion. Venye tuliseka another opinion ndio ilituonyesha ako nayo lakini iko kwa glenoid na kwa scapula. Ule oncology tulipata akatuambia sasa ni, ni treatable na ni manageable. So yani there is no need to cut off his arm. Uh, kwanza tuanze na kimo kwanza ndio kimo itamsaidia tuone kama hiyo tumor ita shrink ndio itaonyesha na kama mkono itakatwa ama itakatwa. So wakafanyiwa kimo tatu. Baada ya kufanywa kimo tatu wakasema nini tumor ikakuwa ime shrink. Wakasema akatwe tena mkono. Mimi nikakata. And Still kijabe. All this is happening within a span of how many months? Two months. So within two months, there you mm. are as his mother because for you, you're fighting for your child mm. and you want the best possible treatment for him. So at that point, had you heard about cancer as a parent? No. You had never heard about cancer? No, 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 never had anyone in your family mm. who mm. had? Yeah. It was just something we'll call on kwenye TV. Yeah. So ikafika pale, what did you have to do now? Because you have doctors who are telling you one thing, but kwa sababu wewe unamjali mtoto wako na utaki akatwe mkono, what did you do now to get informed about what truly is cancer and especially the specific type of cancer that your child had? Mimi nilichukua hatua nikampeleka kafanywa counseling ndio ajue cancer ni nini na one sio mwisho wa maisha. So wakafanywa counseling na nikasek another opinion another opinion venye nilisek nikaenda Kenyatta nikapata daktari daktari akasema wacha afanyiwe kimo kwanza 12 session but atafanywa sita then after six, wataona venye watamfanyia akamaliza kimo ya sita, alimaliza march this year march venye alimaliza daktari tena wakanembea amputation na pale wakati sasa alikuwa eh. anafanywa chemotherapy hiyo eh. chemotherapy ilimwaffect aje ilimwaffect sana kwa sababu ali alingoka meno zingine na kucha na akakuwa na appetite kuhara kutapika kungoka nywele kukuwa mweak right now is he back in school eh alirudi shule na akafanya exam tu Eh, lakini ajikuwa shule for four terms. And how is it being back in school for you? Ina kwa ngumu kidogo. How come? Is it vitu zingine za sijasomea ndizinanilemea. And what about your friends? What do you tell them when they ask you about where you are? And I'm sure they know that you are sick, yeah? So what do you tell them when they ask you din do you have cancer? Eh waliambiwa na rafiki mwingine ya mam aliwaambia na kuanga mgonjwa na wanisaidie juu tulikuwa na fund drive kwa shule so they are very supportive wanakusaidia eh. ukiwa pale shule wanakusaidia pia na masomo mm. kucheza na wewe okay so coming up next i still have another parent with me i have louis indimuli who is a parent to a 4 year old girl who was diagnosed with leukemia and he's going to be sharing with us what his experience of what his experience has been taking care of a child who's living with cancer. Louis, welcome to the Real Talk Roundtable and thank you so much for joining us, of course, here. We are talking about a very important topic, uh, cancer in children. Mm -hmm. So as a parent with a child living with cancer, probably take me back to the day that your child got diagnosed. Um. So thanks for the opportunity. My daughter Zuri had been unwell for about like a month or two prior to the diagnosis, which was in February of this year. So from November, she was like, sometimes she's weak. Uh, and we kept thinking uh, that it's a blood issue, maybe nutrition, because she had just begun school. And we went to, same story, just a hospital near home. Wakatuambia, it's probably she needs blood boosters or so on and so forth. So just a normal infection. That's well, what you thought it was. Yeah, because Alkwamanza Shule, she had just begun school mm. like uh, 
like a few months prior to that. So we kept thinking it's because of, you know, mixing with other kids, Hakuli Vizuri, or then she got pale. She got a bit lethargic. She was quite tired all the time. So we thought it, or rather we were told it's pro probably just something to do with her low blood count. But then when her stomach began uh, growing bigger than normal and she was losing weight, we thought it's something a bit different. So when we took her to Gertrude's, that same night is when I found out that it was, that the doctor sort of let it slip that it is cancer. What do you but mean the doctor sort of let it slip? So here's the thing. We, we, we still have a long way to go in terms of how information is relayed to parents. There's no modus operandi, especially to relay such heavy news. So he said something to the effect that it could be cancer or it could be an autoimmune uh, deficiency syndrome. So you keep wishing for the other one. Uh, but then the more he kept talking, he kept speaking as if he's sure that it's cancer. cancer. But this is like at 3 a.m. at night. Eh? New siku sana. Uh, the child has been admitted with the mother. So I'm there with my mom and my uncle. And the more we talk, the more he seems to casually bring in that it's cancer and not necessarily. The other one is just to rule it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when we found out. Like, usiku wa manane. And, uh, but uh, my mom, Toto, aliambiwa, my wife now was told a bit later on about like, like when, when now we did the full bone test and it was confirmed. But I found out that same night. And maybe just to draw comparisons between how Elizabeth learned of it, because for me, I think how she learned of it was very unethical. Having her child mm. next to her, and you know, uh, him hearing it, yeah. literally, have, not even giving mom time to internalize it and find a way to break it to him mm -hmm. so in the context of that probably later on in the show we're going to be discussing that because i'm going to be having some medical experts joining me here and just discussing are we really prepared as health practitioners when it comes to handling you know just the soft just the softness of how do you break the news that your child has cancer to the family and of course to the child whether the, whether the child is four years or whether the child is older okay now back to Back to your daughter's case, sir. Mm -hmm. So you've learned that she has leukemia and what's running through your mind? Because I know a lot of the times mm -hmm. for the ordinary Kenyan, these are terms and uh, words you come across on movies. <laughs> yeah. You never think it can happen to you yeah. in your real life. Mm. Rightfully so. No one wakes up even dreaming that your child will have cancer because when you get a baby, your primary instinct becomes to really protect this person. All your entire being, kill a kid, you wake up thinking of how to make sure it's your mere, and so on and so forth. Cancer removes it from you in such a painful manner because it's the one thing you can't do. You can't take that pain on behalf of your child. So you feel powerless, basically, as a parent. That's exactly it. Like, yeah. you, you feel like you kind of failed, and then you wonder why, where has it come from? Is it from me? Is it my family? Is it I'm a cool anini? So it's, very, it's a very shocking experience for a parent here. Yeah. And how do you break it to a four-year-old? Thankfully, we didn't need to because uh, at four years, I think there's it's hard to explain the whole entire dynamics. All you deal with is how to comfort her during the injections, during the bad days. Uh, and she, she's not very, a very inquisitive, she's very inquisitive, but she, she's a very silent person. So she just knew that she's sick? Yeah. And yeah. not necessarily understanding what no, it is she's no. suffering from. In that manner, we were fortunate. So I really empathize with Elizabeth here yeah. because an older child, seven years and above, wouldn't really understand because they've come across that word. They get it when the doctor is telling exactly. mom, I need to cut off your and arm. And they see, so maybe the, the thing that we do the most as parents is someone who's four years old, highly what cancer really, really entails. But what they see is your visual is how worried you are, how panicky uh, uh, like you look. So what we do is we tend to, sh to shield them from them seeing us to be broken. So if we get bad news, we cry it out in there, then come back into the room as if everything is normal. Because for a child, they observe all expressions to their minute detail. So for them to know if they're okay, it's not so bad, we as parents have to play that role. W was it the same for you, Elizabeth? When it comes to now, uh, similarly to what Louis is saying, kama mzazi, mm. unamkingaje mtoto wako. You know, there, there's news that where you <coughs> will absorb it, but he doesn't necessarily need to know. Because you know you have to be strong for him. How did you stay strong for your child? Mm. 
ni kumweka ni, ni, ni na mweka, unamweka kando na kando na mimi kama ni kulia hauli akiona ndio akuwe strong kwa tumbe kila wakati ukiona yeye unakuwa strong more strong unamuonyesha hii vita tutaipigana mpaka ukue mshindi yeah. mm. and maybe let's talk about treatment what was treatment like for your daughter um, so we did our test at Gertrude's and the chemo began immediately uh, we were admitted and we just told the doctor you know what answer to kesho we don't know where we'll get the money from but just let's just start and that's a huge one finances because cancer yeah. treatment is not cheap not at all uh, so and the good thing is we have a very good doctor who I'm sure you're going to meet. Dr. Karemi basically gave us a roadmap. One of the things that Usumbuanga Mzazi is lack of knowledge. You don't know what it is that you're actually fighting. And, and you come from a point of not knowing anything about cancer to now you have to deal with it. So the main thing that helps is information. So we, we always advocate for a doctor who can give you a plan, tell you, he dawa ni hi ina itua hivi. It is going to do this, it will do X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. So having a road map sort of eases your stress and pressure. Because now you're able to, to visualize the end goal, which is your child being okay. So treatment, mostly for leukemia, because it's in the blood, it's a lot of injecting uh, into the system and into the bone marrow and into the spinal cord directly. And of course, it involves a number of surgeries to put in a permanent catheter so that you don't always keep having to prick the, your, your daughters to look for veins. Yeah. On the flip side is that all those injections and so on and so forth, and the fact that leukemia attacks the immunity of a child, she's very susceptible to infections, which is the biggest war. Yeah. She's always fighting an infection. So on top of the cancer, now you're dealing with other forms of illnesses? Actually, the, the, the one way to, to finish uh, leukemia is by making sure that your child is hygiene. Meaning, if, if, there's a, if there's any pets in the house, like we had a beautiful dog that you used to love, that one you the get rid of, go. the dog has to go. Me, my chicken that I love also <laughs> because I kept chicken, <laughs> I had to go. Uh, carpets, pia munatoa, everything is hygiene, hygiene, hygiene. Even guests now, you stop having them mm. because someone can come in carrying a pia time when you had to. So, what normally happens is a big chunk of treating the leukemia. Doctors actually may do the treatment at the, at the hospital, but home care is critical. And without that, you'll actually negate whatever treatment you get all done. Is the treatment working? Yes. Um, so the good thing about treating children with cancer is that they've got a better diagnosis than adults. That's because their bodies are still forming, so and they respond better to the treatment. So she, if you see her today compared to how she was when she first went to hospital, she's different. The first thing that, if I probably recall back with my daughter, when we should have probably seen Kunakitu Kibaya, she just stopped drawing. And she was a very avid drawer. She's a very mm. good artist. Uh, and she just withdrew Kabisa Kabisa. Like she changes Kabisa. Her, her moods in a quarter to forty. But then in hospital, after about the three weeks which we were admitted, towards the last week, the last few days, she asked for a drawing book. That's how we knew she's getting a bit better. Mm. So now she's completely back to normal health. The leukemia is in remission, meaning it's, they can't see it. So all you have to do is just to maintain her for about two years. Make sure that she maintains the same treatment, the same hygiene, the same conditions, to make sure it, she doesn't go into a relapse. So the treatment worked 110%. Through ups and downs, through challenges, through infections, kill her kitu, but she's okay, she's in Good health, she's fighting with her younger sister again. She's boisterous and on Gatana Sana, she's back to normal cancer. And we know that as parents, you two families represent the lucky ones because the reality is sometimes cancer actually has the last word and most kids actually do not make it. Well, remember, today we are raising awareness on cancer in children. You can join the conversation via the hashtag Real Talk with Tamima. Let me know what your views, comments, and questions are on today's topic. But right now, we'll be taking a very quick break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Real Talk Roundtable. Now, remember, this is a transformational space where we talk about issues that are affecting our society. And today we are raising awareness on cancer in children. Remember, you can always join the conversation via the hashtag Real Talk with Tamima. Let me know what your views, comments, and feedback are on this topic. Now, my next guests are Dr. Doreen Karimi, who is a pediatric oncologist at Get Roots Children Hospital. And I also have with me Jean Kinyua, who is 15 years old old and Jean is actually living with cancer and she considers herself a cancer champion. Welcome to the round table. So probably let me start with you Jean yes. because earlier on you were telling me that when you grow up you want to be a pediatrician oncologist. Okay so probably tell me about what your experience with cancer has been. I was diagnosed after I finished my class eight. Um, How old were you then? 13? 14? 13. Wait I was turning 14. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was 14 and then um, I just started getting all sad and moody and I don't know why. All of a sudden? Yeah. And then my face started swelling and then it reached a point where I couldn't swallow food. And my mom thought it was an allergy so she told me not to eat meat, don't eat all those. And then the following day my face was swollen over here. And so she knew something is wrong. So we thought it was thyroid and we looked for a thyroid specialist. And we found one at Mpisha. She's called Dr. Acharya. And when we went, she ordered an ultrasound. And on doing the ultrasound design, we found the, the clot that was on one of the main veins. So she knew something was serious and it wasn't thyroid. And she then ordered a CT scan where we found a very big mass between the heart and the lungs. And that's when now they broke the news to, to me, no. To your, to your mom first? Yes. And then now your mom broke the news to you. No. I went, I, I went to India knowing I only had a blood clot. So your mom did not break the news to you throughout that entire process? No, she broke it down when I woke up. I went to the ICU. Um, so when I woke up, after, when I was feeling a little Now this bit is in much, India? Yes. She told me that I have lymphoma. Um, I couldn't even say the word, so I just knew it's lymphoma, and I never googled it, so I knew I had lymphoma. <laughs> Do you wish that your mom had told you earlier? Uh, no. So you it happy that okay, yeah. she told you when she told you? <laughs> yes. And okay, maybe let me just rope in both uh, Dr. Karimi and of course Louise Indimuli because mm -hmm. I think different pa families handle it differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, our first guest, Elizabeth, didn't, didn't really have a choice because the health practitioner sort of like took that choice away from her. Your daughter is young, she's four, so mm -hmm. really for you it was a point of she doesn't really understand. Yeah, so yeah. I have that safety net. Mm -hmm. But what is the ideal? Do you feel like parents should tell their kids or like in Jean's mom's case, mm -hmm. if you don't, it's, it's, it's on a need to know basis? Um, <clears throat> so that is what we call breaking bad news. And it has several approaches and it will be unique for every situation. I bet you for Jean's condition, it must have been an emergency. For maybe Louis and his family, not too much of an emergency. But when we break news as doctors, and this is something we, don't, we are not taught uh, very well in medical school, you have to be very sensitive in how, because cancer is a very, um, very devastating diagnosis, not only for the parent, for the family. Now imagine they also have a little child you have to. Then what is also different about breaking bad news in children is you also have to look at their development. Where are they at in terms of understanding? You notice for a little baby Zuri, she doesn't understand what leukemia is all about. All that she knows is there's something really wrong with her and it needs to be treated. For the little young man, he, all he would know is that there is a swelling, but he might want to know what is happening to me. You're talking about taking away my arm. What is going to be, what is that? So you have to walk with them. For Jean, probably you'd have to look at her understanding and go slowly. And sometimes what we do, we break the bad news to the parents first. And we let them adjust to it. And we work with children, where, with specialists we call child life specialists or psychologists. They sit in with us. And uh, what we do, we assess the parents. We assess how they have taken up the, the information we've given and then we bring in the child at their comfort and we always advise parents please let your child know 
some will say I don't want my child to know and I did have an experience where a parent said they're 12 year old I don't want my child to be told they have leukemia and with time looking at the treatment he was going through and listening to what you'd hear he had something called a blast and he said mommy I've had a blast mommy said don't worry about it it's nothing important and they went to internet they're playing games and all they did he googled and found a blast means there is leukemia. So and basically so this bubble that the parent was trying to create, yeah. mm -hmm. eventually it's, it burst. It burst. It burst yeah. But yeah. fortunately she had tried to also reach out to the child. And, and I say ch parents really do love their children. And you have to remember that even as a clinician is they love their children. And not wanting to share the bad news is their way of protecting their child. But you must hold their hand and help them break the bad news. Mm -hmm. And then pick them up and be ready to take it up from there and give them hope because there's hope these people all here on this table have said there is hope but it's a long and hard journey absolutely yeah. now let's hear from Jean once you found out now that you have lymphoma so what was your initial reaction did you run to Dr. Google no that's the funny thing my mom just told me I had lymphoma and in my head it was uh, lymphoma and Did you know what it meant? No, and I didn't Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was in the hospital, I, used, I was admitted, so the doctors would come every day, and I would say, like, the treatment is okay, they're doing okay. So one day when we were home, um, I did... Now, a, when you came back to Kenya? No, no, or still in, in India, India. That's now in an apartment. Mm -hmm. um, we did a bone marrow biopsy, and um, so the, um, the results came out, and my mom was really worried. She so was like, why are you really worried about... Um, the results. Then I had her talking to someone on the phone. Then she was saying about like the results, and if she was so happy that they came out negative because if it was positive, we would have been dealing with two cancers. Then that's when I knew also oh, lymphoma is a cancer <laughs> because no two cancers meant if that was positive, that was another cancer. In yeah. the family now. No, now still on her diagnosis. Yeah. So oh. there was a risk of her having a second type of cancer. Yeah. Oh. And so probably let me ask you, when it came to your treatment, how was that? It was tough because um, we normally take being strong for granted. And when you do chemo, you're really weak and vomiting and nausea. It's very bad and you just lie down and you're just there. But you're a strong girl. Yeah. So <laughs> how is your health today? It's fine. Everything is fine. And I thank God for that. I think maybe, Dr. Karimi, what you can clarify for us now, in the context of cancer, when does it mean that now your child is out of the boots? I think that's a very important part of it because there's always the fear of parents that it'll, they'll either relapse mm -hmm. or because of the treatment, now you're opening up your child to other illnesses, mm -hmm. which could be long term that they would have to live with for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's a fantastic question. Um, so whenever we sit down and do the treatment planning, we, we let the parents know that this is what we are going to do. We're either going to have, treat, there are three main ways to treat cancer. It's either through surgery, through chemotherapy, or through radiation. We don't have to use all. Some cancers like leukemia, we mainly use chemotherapy. For lymphoma, we actually give chemotherapy and sometimes we also do give radiation. And what's the difference between mm -hmm. now the radiation treatment mm -hmm. and the chemo? So chemotherapy just means we're using drugs. And um, in, in that big bracket, now we also have drugs that target the immune system. So this is mostly now injections, medication, uh, either oral medication. Oral medication or medication we give through the vein or medication we also give through the back um, at the spinal cord where we call it intrathecal medication. All that is chemotherapy. And uh, Zuri's treatment was? Encompassed all those, yeah. yeah. Yes. Obviously, this is a very huge topic and it's very important that you help us actually raise awareness about cancer in children. If this is something that you have gone through as, an, as a family, or if this is something that your friend or your neighbor is going through, it helps just to know how you can help. So when we come back, I'm going to be still talking to Dr. Karimi. And of course, I'm going to be talking to a psychologist just to understand what are the, some of those things that we must be sensitive to when it comes to cancer in children and how it affects families. Don't go too far. We'll be right back.
welcome back to Real Talk. Now, I love hearing from you. Please let me know what your views, comments, and feedback are on today's topic. Now, just to let you know what the reality is when it comes to children who are living with cancer, we took a visit to a treatment center. Take a look. Hi, I'm here at the Gertrude's Children's Hospital in Mudaiga, where the staff and hospital management have been so kind to allow me to bring you firsthand the reality behind the healthcare and treatment for children living with cancer. Now, my first stop is here at the laboratory area. I'm going to be meeting up with a pathologist who will be telling us more about cancer diagnosis. Come with me. Hi, Hi. I'm Dr. Cabrera. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having us. So where do we start? We start here. Uh -huh. You have to change so, so that we allow you to get into Okay, the so I have to wear an yes, overall like yes. yours. It's okay. called PPE. A what? PPE. A PPE. So let me go wear my PPE, guys. Yes. So this is laboratory. Uh -huh. So it's a biohazard place. Okay. Because of the many chemicals and organisms mm -hmm. that we have here. So that's why we have to wear the protective. Yes. We have to wear protective gear when you're working. And in the context of now cancer, yes. how do you diagnose? So cancer is not one disease. Mm -hmm. So cancer is many diseases that we have labeled as cancer. So in children, um, we have many tests to tell us whether the child has cancer to confirm whether the child has cancer and we have tests that we use to monitor when the child who has cancer is on treatment. Okay. So the first test is from the blood test. So I'll take you to the blood test and you'll see me reporting some of the tests. So the blood is drawn. Okay. It comes to the lab through the station. Okay. And then there's barcoding. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the machine. Right. We do the analysis. This is called a hematology analyzer. Mm -hmm. It tells us what how your blood cells are. If they are high or they are normal mm -hmm. or they are low. Okay. And if so they are low or high, that's not good. So this is the first point of screening. So this is the first point of screening. Okay. So there are different cells in the body. Yeah. So they are the white blood cells, they are the platelets and the red blood cells. Mm. So we look at how they are, their numbers, and then we go to Another station, this is microscopy. Okay. And this we look through the microscope. Literally, literally under the microscope. Under the microscope okay. to check how the cells are. So um, here I have what you call bone marrow. Uh -huh. So it's a child who, was, who has been suspected to have cancer of the blood. So we've gone and done a bone marrow aspirate. And this is a bit of a confirmatory test. So we do not need very sophisticated type of mm -hmm. tests, methods. This is enough to tell the doctor the child has cancer. Uh, however, we have more advanced tests that uh, we call flow cytometry to mm -hmm. tell us. So if it's leukemia, which, which type? So, so this is just the first step, and then yes. now you, you get a bit more specific on yes. the so specific type of cancer now. The specific type of cancer. So we do more tests to tell us what type of cancer it is and obviously whatever results that you give from the lab now will determine the course of treatment yes so treatment the doctor cannot start treatment on any patient suspected with cancer unless there's a pathological report mm. coming from the pathologist mm. so uh, the pathology report is the key to starting treatment so people until the pathology report is out a confirmatory report is out treatment cannot start. And in the context of cancer, because we know the diagnosis happens here, but I'm sure also during the treatment and the, the health care, the follow-up health care, yes. a, a lot of the times you still have to keep doing a lot more tests just to find out is the child improving, yeah. is the cancer, uh, is, is, is the Reducing. treatment working. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of test is called monitoring tests. So if you look at the biochemistry equipment here, okay. this, this is the biochemical test. We use those tests to monitor how the, the chemotherapy is working or not, and how to adjust the drugs. And also how the organs are be getting affected, both by the drugs and by the disease. So it's a proper full body workup. It's a full body workup. Every time the child is reviewed by the doctor yeah. on treatment, we want to know how the organs, be it the kidneys, the heart, uh, you know, the, 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 the other organs in the body, the liver, we do those tests and we monitor 
how the child is consistently. Yes. Well, this is very impressive. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm yeah. seeing you had an amazing young team. Yes. Working here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so Thank we'll go on much. to our next step and okay. just trying to understand now the treatment. We've seen how the diagnosis happens and of course the follow-up when it comes back to pathology and how they have to constantly give reports to the doctors. Now it's time to actually meet the doctors and find out more about the treatment. When it comes to treatment for children living with cancer, playtime is no exception. I'm here in the playroom with Angela. So Angela, please let me know, why is it important that when your child is receiving treatment, you must prioritize playtime? Um, well, first of all, when you are a little child, what was your most, uh, the thing that you remember most that you really enjoyed when you were a child? playing. Playing was the most <laughs> memorable thing. So when, when children are admitted, that... Yes that joy of having to play is taken away from them because they are experiencing a lot of procedures, they are, they are being cannulated, the medication is, is painful, then a surrounding that is not familiar to them, so they get very anxious. Huh? Mm -hmm. But when they come here, they are able to get into um, the state where they are happy, uh, they feel safe, they are able to interact with other children, and all those experiences that they've been going through with the procedures and um, and the uh, the pain, they are able to you know forget about it when they come to play. So this is yeah. a place of joy. I'm seeing yes. you guys have some yes. amazing toys in here. There's yeah. a whole playground out there. Yeah. Colorful artwork behind there. Yeah, like you can see, this is all. This is our patients. The patients who have been admitted have come. They color, and then we are able to stick them on the wall. That's amazing. Well, yes. you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. So we're going to we are going to be going to our next stop, which is now the treatment center. So I've just made an amazing new friend, and I want you guys to meet him. Hi. What's your name? I'm Chavis. How old are you? Seven years. And what's my name? Tamima. Oh wow! Look at that. You remembered. <laughs> Okay, so I'm here with Travis and his mom and dad. So Travis is seven, like he's told us, and he's actually here today because he's gonna be receiving his chemo treatment. So let me talk to mom and dad just for a bit. Again, thank you so much for allowing us to actually come here today and sharing your story with our viewers. Yeah. So probably, maybe, tell me a bit, of, tell me a bit about what he, what he was diagnosed with. Uh, at first, we were here for tonsillitis. He had a little bit of cough and uh, a fever. But when they did some tests, they, uh, they realized there was uh, abnormalities with these white blood cells. They were too high, so they had to, to admit us. So that was the blood test, the yes. initial one, because yes. you thought he just had a simple infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just coming for an uh, outpatient, then we could just go back home. But they realized those uh, white blood cells were too high. Yeah. And that's when now you got the diagnosis that he has. Looking yeah, here. days later. We spent a whole weekend. They were trying to to uh, give him uh, antibiotics to see whether those uh, blood cells can uh, go back to normal uh, counts. So uh, after like three days, instead of going down, they were very high. They were like uh, uh, almost ten times the way we came here. So that's when uh, 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 we were an, an, an um, oncologist was called in. And she told me that it was uh, leukemia. It was important for us just to give a face to this disease called cancer and actually put a face to it. What does it mean when a child has cancer? And as well, just to show you the treatment and what it takes for the health care givers and the parents and the child because the reality is Travis is amongst some of the most privileged ch children in this country. And that's a conversation that we want to keep having with our viewers. But right now, let's just see what a session of chemotherapy is like for Travis. So his pulse, his blood pressure um, are being taken. And we want to find out if all his vital signs are normal. In this time, I would also have examined, uh, taken an interval history from the mother on how Travis has been since we discharged him and if there are any issues, um, and they have been relatively well, no complaints today. Um, I also did examine him, a head-to-toe examination, and found that he is uh, clinically well, and basing on what we are seeing from his vital signs, 
his temperature, his blood pressure, his heart rate, everything looks okay. So once I had already uh, reviewed him earlier, I sent a chemotherapy order to the pharmacy and the pharmacy will counter check and make sure that all our doses are correct, that the, we are the drug is getting is correct for his uh, protocol. And once all that is clear, then he goes down and in a secluded area because chemotherapy is, um, we don't want to expose everybody. We prepare chemotherapy in a special unit and it is brought to the ward. So the chemotherapy drugs were prepared and brought to the ward. And now we know Travis is safe. So our second nurse, uh, Sister Betty, has come in with what we call a job card and uh, the medication for Travis. And what the two nurses are currently doing is that they check the patient band for Travis and make sure that they're having the right patient. Yes, Travis, you can show us your, your Travis, your band. Okay. So we have the right patient and they had already looked at my notes and confirmed and even the pharmacy has given a tick that he is supposed to be getting um, subcutaneous cytarabine today. Um, so they counter check and make sure that the drug is correct and then administer the chemotherapy. In addition to that, we also teach the parents some of the side effects that would occur once we give the chemotherapy and we know a drug like cytarabine can cause a bit of nausea, can cause a bit of vomiting, and also can cause a bit of breakdown of the mouth, um, uh, of what we call the mucosa. So we'll, once again, that is how chemotherapy is administered, and we must ensure the patient is safe, and we are also safe, and most importantly, that we keep these patients away from infection because we know their immune system is actually low. Thank you. <laughs> You're a hero. Good boy. Yeah. Good boy. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Travis. How did you see we got that? Good. Shh. Like that, yeah? Welcome back. Joining me right now, I have Philip Odio, who is a psychologist and patient support manager at Faraja Trust. Now, you saw the clip whereby we saw children as they're undergoing treatment. We talked to some of the experts, but I really believe it's important just to contextualize some very key points. You know, we say this is a table of transformation. Work with me, guys, here. Yeah? <laughs> this is a table of transformation. I have with me a biological healer, psychological healer, and of course, somebody who has lived through this. And I want us to start from the basics. What are the symptoms of cancer, especially in children? We heard from Elizabeth's side where she said, mtoto wa kianguka, anaumia, nojile kuanguka kidogo, but, you know, the net effect of that is he's suffering a lot of pain. For you, there were personality changes, she was withdrawn. So what do parents or caregivers need to know when it comes to childhood cancer? Mm -hmm. And usually that is a potential source of a lot of confusion amongst caregivers and also healthcare providers because there are no specific signs for childhood cancer. And most of the children present with pretty much other symptoms that other diseases will. And it takes a caregiver or a healthcare provider to see this doesn't fit the typical mold of a child who is having a common illness. So what are some of the symptoms you'd see? That easy fatigability, they are not playing as they would as normal. Um, they look a little pale. Um, and this pallor, the, the caregiver or the healthcare provider can't explain it with having lost blood recently. Um, I say any swelling on the body should be taken care of. And especially when it persists more than a week or two, that should be investigated. Usually there's a common cancer we see in the eye in children. And what mm. happens, it's called retinoblastoma as parents. And I like it that now parents love to take photos of their children. And actually as you take a photo, you notice like the eye looks like a cut eye or it has a white reflex. And that's a very, in, a very common sign we see with that tumor. Um, another sign would be any pains, bones, a child always saying, I have pain in my knee, I have pain in my joints. Yes, they could be growing pains, but if they persist and they have another symptom, 
these haven't checked out. If a child has any swelling in their tummy, it needs to be checked mm. out. And sometimes the parents, as they're showering their children, they feel something and they say, I think I felt a mass. Don't overlook it. Another thing, just like the little boy who was here before, a lot of them come in saying, I had a fall and now I have pain somewhere. But the fall is not the cause of the tumor. And most patients actually will come and say, I think it's that fall that caused the osteosarcoma. Actually, the fall is what brings the tumor to attention. Mm -hmm. And then an x-ray is done and they're diagnosed. Um, so basically, any child, I, I notice, I tell parents and even other healthcare providers, no child is in a gym trying to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So if a parent comes in and saying, my child is losing weight and I can't tell why, take a look there's something that could be going on. Um, for brain tumors, very interesting, they present with children with headaches. And I say, again, how often do you hear children complaining of headaches? Very unlikely, but if a child is always waking up in the morning and saying, mommy, I have a headache, I have a headache, and sometimes they'll just vomit and go back to their normal self, have a good day at, at school, come in the evening, do their homework, and then wake up again. That's a very common sign of, of brain tumors. I think for me what I'm hearing especially mm -hmm. here is just to parents, pay attention. Yes. Mm. You have to pay attention. You have to figure out what, you, what normal is yes. for your child. It's yeah. true. So that when you're deviating away from normal, no. you catch it. You yeah. got it right. Yeah. If yeah. you're not paying attention, some of these symptoms are very hard to miss. Yes. Yes. And probably now I want to focus more on the emotional and mental bit of it mm. because it's a lot. Even for an adult, this is a lot. And make no mistake, we're not trying to fear monger here. We're just trying to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. So when it comes now to ideally what is the what is the best way to handle this because early on which touched on it their parents will not disclose there mm. are those who choice is taken away from you doctor will disclose on your behalf mm. but ideally what's the best way to handle a child who is living with cancer yeah thank you for inviting me to the panel uh, it's very important for us to look at uh, each child as an individual and then uh, Dr. Tari also had mentioned alluded to it that we need to look at the developmental uh, age or, and stage of the child. So like for Mr. Indimoli, he noticed that his child is younger, you know, five years probably he doesn't have an understanding of cancer. So he decided to withhold that information to the child. And then Dean, who is 13 years old, understands uh, what cancer is about. So uh, the way the news was broken to the mother while the child was there, of course, is unprofessional and unethical. So what we need to do is look at each, each child. And then, of course, you also look at their personalities because mm. you have children who maybe they are teenagers and uh, they are that personality that probably will not be able to take this new. So being sensitive uh, to the child. Most of the cases uh, in Africa, you find the mothers or the parents shielding the children and then maybe informing them later when they are towards the tail end of the treatment. Yes, yeah. And when it comes now to supporting the parents, because the other thing here when you mentioned mothers, yeah. you know, and I think we have to applaud Mr. Indimoli because, you know, the reality is a lot of the times, mama and wanachua pale, nangana. And sometimes the, it might not be deliberate because also we know that this is a very expensive disease. Mm -hmm. But now when it comes to the two caregivers, how yeah. can they give each other support? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, a very pertinent question. Number one, we have who is the primary caregiver, which in most of the cases the are, the, are the mothers, yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's very rare cases we have people like Indemoli uh, coming on board. So uh, number one, uh, the diagnosis of cancer is, is really impactful for both. So one thing it can do is it can bring them together or it can tear them apart. Mm -hmm. And we've seen cases whereby actually the cancer diagnosis uh, tears the family apart because the man is struggling uh, with the reality of losing their child because that is what it is. There's a possibility that uh, you might lose your child. So, of course, the way men deal with stress, how do they deal with it? So, dysfunctional coping mechanisms, you they might withdraw. find they withdraw to themselves or some might find themselves drinking more or some might find themselves becoming angry with everyone because you're wondering, why me? Why my child? You know, and why this child? So that, that can bring in a, a bit of um, uh, a, a emotional disruption in the family. But one of the, the other way is they can also become uh, united. It can bring them together because it's a challenge that is ahead of us. How do we then deal with this challenge? And you find that when the family members are united, 
actually it also helps the emotional uh, well-being of the child because the child sees the family is united, the parents are together, everyone is working at a, as a team. And then what is important is it's also important to have uh, turns in caregiving because caregiving is really emotionally draining. So if it's the mother who is taking care of the child in the hospital, we need to have a way that the father can and also step come, in. step in at some point and release the mother. That's one of the things that I, I, I advise the, the, the patients. And the I think for me this one now, it's, it's a reality when it comes to certain cancers. Yeah. And when you, and I'm sure Dr. Karimi for you, this is something that you must have seen a lot. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at a family, the child has cancer, you know, the child is on treatment, but you know, yeah, you know that cancer is going to have the last one because this child is not going to make it. Mm. So how do you help families cope with that? Because thank God for Indimuli and of course for Elizabeth, they represent the fortunate ones. Yeah. Yeah, but we know that this conversation also has an ugly side of it. Yeah. So how do you prepare families? And even when you have other children who are involved and they're seeing mm. their sibling going through this. Mm. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Actually, it reminds me of the first case that I handled over 10 years ago of a child who had osteosarcoma. And uh, the mother knew that this child was not going to make it. So I had to break the news uh, to the other kids. That's a very difficult thing to do because it's an emotional thing, very tough because the parents love their children. Mm. But we have to also tell them the reality. So it's in a sense, after knowing the diagnosis, if you know that this child is not going to make it, then you begin to help them to look at the other possibility uh, that uh, your child will not be able to make it at some point. And they begin to, they might be resistant uh, at the beginning, but with the time as the treatment progresses and they see the decline in health, then I think the reality will begin to hit them. And then it's also important for us then to prepare them if the child uh, happens to uh, not make it, you know. How are we going to uh, help other kids who are left behind? So it's not an easy thing. It's a very difficult uh, balance because I want to give them hope. But at the same time, I know the reality is uh, this child might not be able to make it. So it's giving them uh, information in bits. They might not like it, but they will begin to see. Of course, you can see this child is not doing well. And I think just to contextualize that, I think uh, worldwide, when you're looking at uh, Western countries, when it comes to children surviving cancer, the statistics are, should I say, they're very favorable because they say yeah. almost seven or eight out of every 10 children suffering from cancer make it. But in our country, those percentages and those figures are actually much lower. It's actually two or three out of ten yeah. yes. who make it. Yeah. Sure. And we know for a fact that a lot of that has to do with how generally our healthcare system is structured. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even, do we have research or funding that's allocated to research when it comes to cancer and specifically cancer in children in this country? No, we don't. And mm. um, that has been a huge challenge for us because then our children present with very advanced disease, which even in the Western world, would end up having a very poor prognosis. Mm. And that is something we need to change because a lot of childhood cancer is curable. And I want Indimuli mm -hmm. to close this show for us today. And we are, we are switching it up because y you've lived through it. This entire conversation that I'm trying to have more people join. Mm -hmm. So probably just to wrap up this conversation, talk to the nation, <laughs> just to sum up this oh, conversation. Um, you see, as a parent, you are left with little no choice when you get that diagnosis, yeah? However, you need to understand that Zuri is proof that it's doable. Not only is it doable, but it's actually manageable. You need to just understand that you're not in this alone. Arm yourself with information. Reach out to people who either have gone through it or information that you can get widely through social media or through regular media as well. What you need to understand is that cancer is treatable, highly, highly mm. treatable, mm. and the public is more than willing to support you when you're fighting this. Let's support each other so that as the doctors do their job to find the cure, we're simply learning as we go. Mm. Don't be afraid, your child needs you, it shall be well. Mm. Absolutely, well that's a wrap from me to me, until next time, thank you so much for staying with us. This is a Real Talk Roundtable. <laughs>
Special thanks to E Plus for medic and ambulance services.